here and welcome to the Business in Hawaii show. I am Dalen Yanagita and we are broadcasting live from the Think Tech Studios in downtown Honolulu. If you want to tune in live, we are at www.thinktechhawaii.com. And while there, please subscribe to our programs and get on our mailing list. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to share with you stories of local businesses by local people. Our guests share with us their journey to building a successful business right here at home. In the Think Tech studio today is none other than our very own Miss Keisha King. Keisha, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dalen, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here as a guest. I am so excited to have you on the other side um, because I do know that you are um, one of the most humble people I know. And I think it's a great opportunity for our audience to get to know you a little bit. Um, I, I do know you in different circles, um, but I know you're, all, you're a special education teacher. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how you got into that? Oh, um, well, thank you, first of all, for the compliments. I got into teaching a dozen years ago after being an HR director, human resources director for several years. I climbed uh, the corporate ladder and thought that was exactly what I wanted. I had a great time doing it for as long as it lasted, but I felt like there was more that I could do. Um, my own children were in middle school at the time, and I started to see the needs uh, that their teachers had over and over and over again. And so I decided to jump in and help where I could. And one of those areas was in, I was the PTA president for both of my children's schools. And that opened my eyes to the greater needs of the teachers and the education system. And I just thought, I can do so much more, so why not jump in with both feet on the ground and somehow ended up thinking that teaching as my profession was a way to really help. And so that's what I did. And special education just so happened to be the perfect niche for me. Um, I have always been an advocate for those that society would like to forget. And there's no better place to do that or to be than in the special education field and being an advocate for students who have unique learning abilities. It's no secret that I have a tremendous amount of respect for our teachers, our public school teachers, as well as our private school teachers, because it's a difficult job. You're influencing the lives of our young people and it's very difficult. Um, but more than that is uh, taking on the responsibility of being a special education teacher. And I think it's just a, the amount of patience and understanding and dedication that you have to have to your skill just unbelievable. So I commend you for, for taking that on and embracing it and making it a part of, of who you are. Um, as I had mentioned, I know you from other circles as well, and I do know um, that you're an active Rotarian. So tell us about what you do as a Rotarian. Oh, it's, um, first of all, such an honor to be a Rotarian. That happened for me. I was inducted this past July and I was so excited and I still am so excited because it embodies everything that I love giving back um, in so many different ways. I am not always able to attend the events because I'm at school, but the ones that I can attend um, bring so much joy to other people. And I think that's just an expression of who we, we are as Rotarians and then who we are as individuals. Um, you and the others in our East Honolulu Rotarian Club um, mean so much to me and have helped to make me feel very welcomed. And we do a lot of good things. And I love that service above self. So I, I really am happy about that. Rotarians around the world do an, an amazing, an amazing job for, for all of us and for our communities. And I think it's, you know, it just um, comes together with, you know, your, your belief in giving back and, and how you wanted to pay it forward. Um, yeah. Because you and I were talking 
um, earlier and, and you really felt compelled to, to pay it forward. And so through your special education teaching and now um, being a Rotarian, you definitely are doing that. But I know that it doesn't stop there. <laughs> I know that there are still <laughs> other, other things that you do and you give graciously of your time. Um, do you want to share with us what some of the, those things are? No, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've taught my children, my biological children and my students for years that it's important to give of your time, your talents and your resources. And one of the biggest components I have is time. Um, I have a lot of time to after school um, to do different things right here in Honolulu and I've done it where I'm from in Virginia um, because I had great examples. Um, I was raised in part by my parents and my grandparents and they were all givers. They gave from their hearts so freely and we all had a very privileged life. And I didn't recognize it as a child because everyone around me lived that same privileged life. And then as I got older and matured, I started to recognize not everybody lives the same. And if you can help someone, um, you should do that. So I tried to do that through um, different community events. Um, feeding the homeless is one. Um, giving in other ways to the homeless, such as making sure that they have um, pillows from my own house or, you know, different blankets and things that they need like that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot that I do. I don't necessarily want to share it all, but um, I am often on the scene on my Facebook uh, live page saying this and that that I'm doing but there's so much behind the scenes that um, is equally important. And I would just encourage any of our viewers to do that. Give of your time, your talents, and your resources to make a difference in the lives of others. Um, I don't think that we're here just for ourselves. And um, I would say I'm blessed to be a blessing. So. Well, you are a blessing. That's, I hope so. <laughs> um, so I do know that one of the roles that you're taking on, um, and it's ramping up pretty quickly, is that you are a, a crucial part of our 2020 census. In fact, um, you are the NAACP Complete Count Chairperson. Um, and my goodness, that sounds like a huge title. Um, first of all, so tell, tell us what you do in that role, and then tell us about the 2020 census that you're doing that for. Sure. Um, as a member of the NAACP, um, I'm actually the chairperson of the Education Committee. And uh, one of the things that falls under that position is to make people aware of the 2020 Census and to educate them on what it's all about, uh, to help identify and answer the tough questions and alleviate some of the fears that people have had in completing the census. And then of course, to make sure that people understand the importance of the census. Give us a little yeah. background on the census. And um, I know that it doesn't happen every year and 2020 is a, is a big year because it is happening. Could you give us a little background on what the census is and why it's important? Sure. So the census is a complete count of everyone in America in their homes. So who is living with you now is what the census aims to discover. And this census is completed every 10 years. And I'm excited because this year is, the, or this decade, is the first time that the census will come in three forms. So typically in years or decades past, the census was completed uh, via someone coming to your home or a form being mailed to your home. And those options are still available. But what's new is the electronic count, the electronic count. So you can use your smartphone, you can go on your home computer and you can complete the census information. So I wanna to talk to you about why we ask, okay? The 2020 census is 
very easy. And then the questions are simple. So it's not like a test per se. Um, when you fill out the census, you help determine how many seats your state gets in Congress. You guide more than $675 billion in federal funding, and it's distributed to states and communities each year. So not every 10 years, but each year. And then it creates jobs, provides housing, prepare for emergencies, and build schools, roads, and hospitals. Now, that last point is very important to all of us here in Hawaii. I know you would agree on that. Um, so tell me about how the census reaches everyone. Okay. So we want to have a population count where we determine the number of people living or staying in your home. Any additional people living or staying in your home um, can be counted at that time. Doesn't matter if you are an owner or a renter, just who is with you there. Then we also ask about, your, we ask you for your phone number and then your name and the names of those living with you. And the reason we gather all of this information is because we want to make sure that we get everything that is due to us as a state. As I mentioned, once we find out this information and de make determinations about what the population is here in the state of Hawaii, not just on Oahu, but all islands, then we can create jobs for our area or for our state help to provide housing and prepare for emergencies, build schools, roads, and hospitals. So when I think about our roads right now, if they have oh. a complete count, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> we know about all the potholes and what roads to avoid. Just imagine if we were able to get everyone counted so that we would not have the potholes and the way that it's a trickle down effect. So the way that that works is that once people complete the census, then they can make determinations about what money we receive. Now, I'm looking through my notes because I want to give you the exact amount of money that we have received right here in Hawaii. It's a pretty big number. I'm happy to say it. I hope we get more this time. So the number is... Three billion six hundred eighty-two million five hundred forty-three thousand eight hundred forty-five dollars through fifty-five federal spending programs, and that was guided by the information gathered during our 2010 census. So now, in 2010, when the census was completed, we had I don't know how many people at the time here, but I do know it's a whole lot more here now than there was then. <laughs> so we should be able to receive more money to those 55 federal programs. And we might even have more programs that we're able to fund because I won't say we're overpopulated here in our state, but we certainly are very well populated. That number was a mouthful, that's for sure. Yes. And I, and I do yes. hope that, that we, we are able to increase that number. Keisha, we're going to yeah. go to a quick break. Um, but okay. when we come back, I'd love to hear more about how you got involved um, and, okay. and perhaps some of the, the specific things that people are going to be seeing out there about how they can participate in the census. We're going to take oh, that short to. break. This is Business in Hawaii. We'll see you back here shortly. Hi, I am Yukari Kunisue, host of Konnichiwa Hawaii. Think Tech Hawaii's Japanese program, broadcasting every Monday from 2 p.m. I usually invite a guest in Japanese language community who does interesting things, and I'd like to share stories with you guys. Please tune in and listen to Konnichiwa Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Stan Osterman, Stan the Energy Man, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. If you're really interested in finding out what's going on in energy, especially here in Hawaii, but also all the way around the world, and especially if it has to do with hydrogen, look into Stan Energy Man every Friday, 12 o'clock, Think Tech Hawaii. Be there. Aloha. Welcome back. <laughs> Sorry. This is Business in Hawaii, and with us today is none other than the Miss Keisha King, a very familiar face here on Think Tech, in our Think Tech studios. 
Keisha, so we were talking when we went to break, we were talking about how you are volunteering um, to help with the 2020 census. Tell me about how you got involved and perhaps some of our viewers want to get involved. Is it too late? Oh, no, not at all. I got involved through the NAACP. The NAACP was the first complete count committee formed on, in the state. And so now we have several different complete count committees. And I should mention that all of our forms that we're sending out and all of the information uh, regarding the um, the census is in 13 different languages. Wow. So every group on island mm -hmm. can participate in the completion of the form because most of the uh, most prominent languages are represented. Um, and I was simply in as a member of the NAACP, I was simply invited to attend this um, committee meeting. And um, really, I was honored because I think that it's an important thing for us to do for all people across the state. Now, to your question, is it too late for people to get involved? No, it is not. We need your help. Here are some important dates. As I mentioned earlier in the show, we have electronic means of counting people now. So what that means is beginning on March 12, 2020, you can go online or use your smartphone to answer all the questions on the census right then and there. And there are several organizations, both those that are affiliated with the NAACP and those who are members of the other complete count committees throughout the state who are organizing different means of communicating that information to their individual groups. So what that might look like is a group of people might get together, let's say, at their church and they might have a census day. Anytime between March 12th and April 1st, they can have a complete count committee, send information to all of their followers, and they can complete the census right then and there. And it's really easy. So anyone can do it, but there are a lot of volunteers who can help. Now, the actual census day is April 1st. So when I did my show on the census, I said, don't be fooled, be counted. And of course, April 1st is April Fool's Day, but it's more important for that to be complete count day for the census. So as you know, Governor Ige and Lieutenant Governor uh, Josh Green um, both uh, worked together here recently, as a matter of fact, but starting a year ago, they determined that they were in full support of the census and they tried to get the word out so that others could help and participate. Well, just Tuesday, uh, I attended the census day at the Capitol where both gentlemen took the time to address all of those participants. And we gathered more information about the census. We spoke to the crowd or they spoke to the crowd and helped everyone to find out the most relevant information to their groups. So we had a Filipino group or table um, for um, that particular uh, group of people. And then we also had people who were members of uh, AARP. And for some reason, somebody asked me if I was a member of the AARP. I was like, come on, give it a break. <laughs> but <laughs> I thought, why are you asking me this? Ugh. But I didn't realize you can join early. So keep that in mind. You can join early. That's what she said to clear that up. But Every nice possible save. organization, <laughs> nice save, that's what I said. <laughs> Every possible organiza organization was represented at the census day on the Capitol. And it turned out to be really informative. So as to your question about, is it too late? No, anyone can go to census.hawaii.gov 
or census2020.gov. And as soon as you go to the front page, there's information about employment. We still need to hire and train people who are going to go door to door or help with other tasks as it pertains to the census. So if you'd like to get in on a federal job as easy as it is, well, normally it's not very easy to get a federal job, but this makes it very easy to get in and do something that's important for our state and the entire nation. Amazing. So, it's Amazing. never too late. I think some general questions that people might have about participating in the census is how long is the census? How many questions are we talking about? Okay, let's address that. What we ask, um, in addition to who's living with you, whether or not you're an owner or a renter, your telephone number and your name, we also ask for sex, age, date of birth, um, whether you're, you have a Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. We then ask your race um, and whether a person lives or stays somewhere else. We ask the relationships of each member in the home and then there is that issue regarding uh, citizenship, okay? And that raised a lot of questions. Now, there's always been a citizenship question on the census, but I wanna make it clear to anyone who has a concern, this is not citizenship information that can harm you in any way. So if you are not a US citizen, if you complete this form and you say that you're not, no one is going to come and get you. It is not developed or um, it, it's not for that purpose. And I wanna address the fear that people have had in years past, even within my family. I have family members that lived in Pennsylvania. And I remember the 1990 census when I was, I'm just gonna lie and say I was two. <laughs> but some of them were talking about not completing the census. They were afraid about Uncle Sam knowing too much information or more information than he needed to know. He doesn't need to be in my business is what they were saying. And I want to address that by simply saying you shouldn't have any fear about that. Okay, let's erase that fear um, because it is not designed to harm you in any way. It's going to help. And I just wanna read off some of the committees that actually receive the help. And Dalen, you tell me how we're doing on time because I don't wanna over speak, but here's a list of a few of the programs, okay? And this is financial assistance programs. So medical assistance programs such as Medicaid, federal direct student loans, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Medicare Supplemental Medical Insurance Part B, Highway Planning and Construction, Federal uh, Pell Grant Program, Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, Very Low to Moderate Income Housing Loans, Title I Grants to LEAs, State Children's Health Insurance Program, National School Lunch Program, and the list goes on and on. We talk about WIC and Head Start and foster care and health care centers, school breakfast program, um, public and Indian housing, low-income home energy assistance, child and adult care food program, uh, vocational rehabilitation grants to the states, and as I said, the list just goes on and on. These are the places, some of them, because there's over 55, who receive that 3.6 billion point six, um, or $3.6 billion worth of uh, program obligations. Now, in the so, fraction of that list, there are so many great mm -hmm. programs that we know even we take advantage of um, and, and mm -hmm. our loved ones take advantage of, whether it's Medicare, whether mm -hmm. it's... And so I, I see the, the importance in that. I want to ask you a question about um, safety, security, and fraud, right? So okay. for those folks who are going to be taking the census because somebody comes to their home or, or whatnot, um, mm -hmm. will they ever ask for a social security number? No, 
No, and they how, were not. How do I know if someone is an official uh, representative of the census before I give out my information? They'll have enough proper ID to display to make sure that you are aware that they are official. Again, now these are, once they're hired, they become members of the federal government. Okay, so there'll be something representing that. And well, the, if you have questions or doubts about that, you can contact the census.gov via the uh, internet. Um, there are phone numbers that you can call. And to avoid that, simply do it online between March 12th and April 1st. And I just want to emphasize one more time, no social security numbers, right? That is correct. And I think that's a concern for a, a lot of people once once someone asks for their social security numbers. Um, will uh, folks from the census be taking in information by phone as well? Um, you can contact them by phone. Um, it's when we say by phone, though, we're specifically meaning your smartphone to answer the questions online in that way. Um, and I want to talk about the safety again. Okay, I want to read directly from their website. So it says the Census Bureau is required by law to protect any personal information we collect and keep it strictly confidential. The Census Bureau can only use your answers to produce statistics. In fact, every Census Bureau employee takes an oath to protect your personal information for life. Your answers cannot be used for law enforcement purposes or to determine your personal eligibility. Uh, eligibility for government benefits. Fantastic. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that. I, You're welcome. You know, I think that's valuable information. I think there's so many questions that people have and, and they don't know that they can go right to the internet to learn more about the census and have any of the their questions answered. Um, is there anything mm -hmm. that you want to leave us with? We have about 30 seconds and I want to make sure that we give you every bit of time. <laughs> well, I want to make sure that people know that beginning March 12th, you can go online and answer the questions for the census. Okay, so you don't have to wait until April 1st to do this. In fact, the sooner you do it, the better. That's thing one that I want to emphasize. If you do not do it between March 12th and April 1st, you can simply complete by online, by mail, or by telephone on April 1st. Fantastic. And remember, don't be fooled, be counted. Ms. Keisha King, thank you so much for joining us. Big thank you to the production staff here in the studio. If you would like to be a guest on our show, please subscribe and leave a comment below. Business in Hawaii airs every Thursday at 2 p.m. and we look forward to seeing you here next week.